GettingPositiveKarmaNow.com presents Bhagavad Gita for All Lectures by Nalan K. Narula Recorded in front of a live audience Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So last time we had completed the 8th text, chapter 2 of Bhagavad Gita and basically Arjun was saying that I am very aggrieved, sorrowful Because even if I win and get the kingdom and sovereignty of a kingdom on earth equivalent to that of the demigods, all my relatives are dead and gone, or many of them are dead and gone, uh, I would not be able to live. I would not be able to tolerate this benefit or it would be as good as ashes because my family members are no more and we have been fighting with them and we have killed them and even though they have killed some of us even if I survive without my relatives I can't really enjoy any of the benefits so that is the continuity then we have text 9 so, Sanjay is reporting to Dhritarashtra, father of Duryodhan and the other Kauravs, the Kaurav brothers, the hundred, Sanjay Vacha, Evam Muktva Hrishikesham Gudakesha Parantapaha Nayotsa iti govindam uktva tushnim babhuva After having spoken like this, Arjun, Parantapa, Arjun is supposed to be the chastiser and punisher of enemies, he is the punisher. He told Krishna, iti govindam uktva tushnim babhuva ha. I shall certainly not fight. He became silent. I shall not fight. Now, Yotse, hmm, Iti, Govindam to Krishna, the giver of pleasure, the, the all attractive one to whom the senses are attracted. Uktva Tushnim. He said this to Krishna and then he became silent. I will not fight. Final conclusion. Total depression condition, total giving up, that my family consideration is more important than my Kshatriya Dharma. And uh, Arjuna has used a lot of logical arguments and discussions, uh, statements he has made, quoting scriptures and authorities. And he has come to some concocted idea as to how he should give up his Dharma, hmm, using the support of scriptural evidence to bolster his view hmm, all entirely speculatively and sounding like a very wise intelligent person he has come to the conclusion that he shall not fight it is not worth fighting it is better to give it up hmm. then text number 10 the muvacha hrishikesha prahasanni bharata Senayor Ubayor Madhe Visidantam Idam Vachaha Tamu Vacha Hrishikesha at that time then to Arjun Hrishikesha, the master of the senses, Krishna, Prahasan Eva with an expression on his face which was like smiling. It was not exactly smiling. 
like a smile, he addressed Vishidantam, the lamenting one, the following words. Now what does it mean that Krishna was having an expression on his face like smiling? He was sarcastic. Why? Because here is Arjun using these speculative arguments hmm? and he is talking as a very wise man, but he is actually talking nonsense like a person who is unintelligent. Hmm? So, at this point in time, even though Arjun is saying that I surrender to you, he is still maintaining a vestige of his uh, logic and intelligence and his conclusion, he is thinking that my conclusion is very good because I have used all these logics and uh, very heavy duty uh, reasonings. And so Krishna is smiling sarcastically to remove the last vestiges of Arjun's false ego and his ahankar and his pride in his conclusion to just demolish that aspect of his false ego. And this becomes clear when he speaks further. Krishna speaks to him. Text 11, Shri Bhagavan Uvat Ashochyan anavashochastvam pragyavadam scha bhashase gatasun agatasun cha Nanushochanti Pandita <laughs> Krishna is really giving it to him nicely in this one. Sri Bhagavan Uvacha, he said, Asochyan Anvasochya. You are mourning for that which is not worthy of mourning or lamenting. Hmm? Pragyanvad. Pragyanvad is speculative knowledge that sounds very intelligent, that sounds that it is uh, based on authority and so on, but it is total speculation and actually nonsensical. Pragyanvad. Bhasha say, giving lecture, speaking, such high-flown words. Huh? But you have forgotten the purpose of life and the meaning of life. Gata asun agata asun Na anusho chanti pandita. Pandita. Pandita is a person who is wise and learned. And the root word of pandita is panda. Panda comes from the ability to discriminate between the truth and falsity. A pandit is a person who can actually see the difference between the truth and the false. So that is pandita. Not just because you are some kind of a smart pandit or you are calling yourself a pandit or you are occupying the position of a pandit. It, you have to be actually able to see the difference between the truth and falsity. So, those who are pandita, they do not lament either for the living or they do not lament for the dead as well. Neither. Why is that? So There is a reason for that. In the twelfth text, Krishna says that, Natwa evaham jatu nasam natvam neme janadhipa na chaiva na bhavishyamaha sarvevayam mataha param. Never was there a time, never, that I became non existent. And never was there a time when you became non-existent. Nor all these kings, Janadipaha, nor all these kings, nor all these people, and nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. So you are lamenting for something which is foolish. So that is not done by a pandita, a wise person. Thirteenth hmm? text. Dehi no asmin yatha dehi kaumaram yauvanam jara 
तथा देहांतर प्राप्ति धीरस्तत्र न भूयते देहिनो अस्मिन जस्ट एज इन द बॉडी द इन द एम्बॉडीमेंट फॉर्म फ्रॉम यूथफुलनेस फ्रॉम बॉयहुड चाइल्डहुड टू यूथफुलनेस टू ओल्ड एज देर इज द ट्रांसफरेंस ऑफ द सोल सेल्फ इन दीज डिफरेंट बॉडीज द धीर द सोबर द सेंसिबल द बैलेंस्ड वंस द वंस हू कैन डिस्क्रिमिनेट देर फोर आर नेवर मूयते नेवर डिल्यूडेड नॉट इन मो एंड माया सिंपली बिकॉज दे अंडरस्टैंड दैट एज द सोल विच इज एम्बॉडीड इन दिस बॉडी इट ट्रेवल्स फ्रॉम चाइल्डहुड टू यूथ टू ओल्ड एज and it remains constant the body is constantly changing but you remain constant and it is eternal that is the evidence the scientific evidence is that you continue your soul self continues so it is foolish to lament for something like this so krishna is telling arjun that while you are using these very fancy arguments they are actually put in a concocted way they are speculative they are irrelevant simply because you are not being able to see the truth and this is the reality that just as the embodied soul moves from in the same lifetime in changing bodies uh, there is nothing to fear because the body is coming and going and eventually there is no evidence to show that the soul self terminates when the body is no longer serviceable so you are not pandita you are not able to discriminate and see the truth and the reality and you are in fact in illusion king all these high sounding speculative things trying to bolster your false ego position because all of these considerations that you are feeling anxious about are coming from the bodily concept of life so they are coming from the bodily concept because is who are attached or attracted to the objects of the senses and that is unreal why is it unreal it's because that is not a permanent position the permanent position is that you are constant the body is not and all these considerations that you are thinking are so important are coming only because you are attached to the expansion of the bodily consideration family relatives you know, coming through the senses now the senses are connected to the mind which is connected through the senses which is leading to the bodily concept of life for example if you are in a very deep sleep state there is no sorrow so it's not a constant state the sorrowful state or comes when you are in a consciousness condition where your mind is active and the mind is connected through senses to various objects of the senses so that is the cause of your grief and not the reality so you must be able to discriminate so it is very important to understand that the objects of the senses are not constant they will come and go whereas you will remain so it is ultimately your duty that remains what is what you are charged with achieving or doing in this lifetime hmm? never was there a time when i did not exist i never ceased to exist neither did you nor did all these kings nor all these people and in future exist and what is that future when you no longer have this body because the understanding is that earlier uh, krishna had told arjun and arjun had also mentioned this uh, in a different context that even if i get the best kingdom like mentioned to him earlier that if you do your duty as a kshatriya warrior even if you lose uh, it is no loss to you because you would have executed your dharma and you will go to the heavenly planets and if you are uh, uh, successful your fame will be there throughout the universe so go to the heavenly planets means what you will not go in this body obviously because this body cannot go there because the vibratory rate is very different so you'll have to go in a different subtle body so that concept is already there that understanding is already there that you know we have changing bodies 
and it is the senses and the mind through which we connect that gives us this illusion. So the bodily concept of life is what is illusory. Who is my relative? Who is my parent? Who is my son? Who is my child? Who is my husband? Who is my wife? You never saw them previously and you will not see them again after this lifetime. Then what is there? You had previous husbands, wives, fathers, sons, daughters, relatives, uncles and aunts, which are gone. They are all disappeared. Where are they today? You don't know. The soul self has been traveling in many different bodies. So he's saying you are lamenting for something that is unworthy for lamenting, either the living or for the dead. Don't lament for the living. Oh, poor fellow, so sad, so bad. Uh, just sending him some sad vibrations to make him feel worse. And don't lament for the dead, because what is dead? They are still there. It's just the body that is gone. The consciousness self, the constant consciousness self is alive, always. It never ceases to exist. So therefore, while using all these wise-sounding words, you are actually being foolish and you are in illusion. So get rid of your illusion, Arjun, is what Krishna is telling Ar Arjun. Text 14, because this sums it up very nicely. Matras parshastu kantaya sitosna sukha dukha daha Agamapino nityastam tiktasva bharata. Matras parshas tu kantaya. It is the sense perception of winter, summer, happiness, unhappiness, hot and cold that comes and goes and it is non-permanent. It is disappearing. And they are changeable. So just try and tolerate this. Bharata, O oh descendant of the Bharat dynasty, after which our country is named also Bharat Varsh, great uh, king, Bharat, right, who followed the proper principles of the regulatory principles and the kingly principles of Vedic Dharma, leading people towards liberation, free from the illusion of the bodily concept. That was the whole country, the whole nation, at that time the whole world, because Bharat was one entire world, uh, structure was there, ruled by King Bharat, that it is taking the entire population away from this illusion. So he's reminding uh, Arjun that you have such a great history, you have such great forefathers and ancestors who did this, how come you are uh, in illusion right now? So wake up. Hmm? So you are you are an eternal being and you, you need to understand that these things that you are so concerned about are temporary and they are not of great importance. The summer will come and go, the winter will come and go, the hot and cold will come and go, relatives will come and go. Hmm? And these are all coming from sense perception. All coming from sense perception. Dukhda agama, and they appear to give you pain, and they are non-permanent. So just tolerate it. Tritikshasva. Non-permanent. So, you have a great heritage, you have a great responsibility, do not give it up. Do not be deluded by the temporary manifestations of the bodily concept of life, because without, when the senses are not active as in deep sleep, for example, uh, there is no sense of unhappiness, there is no sorrow. So it's non-permanent. Your real state is that when you are not in touch with the expansion of the senses. Yes, you have certain duties, but now you are trying to give up those duties in consideration for some limited, temporary, illusory, maya-type duties, illusory duties, that you have concocted pragyanvad out of your speculative, apparently intelligent sounding talk, but it is foolish. So you are in ignorance, and Krishna 
as spiritual master to whom Arjun has now surrendered, is beginning to remove ignorance and open his eyes to the truth so that he can be Pandita. Pandita means one who can discriminate between the truth and illusion and falsity. So we will pause here today at this text, number 14, chapter 2 of Bhagavad Gita. And if you have any questions, I shall answer them. Yes. Uh, so uh, uh, whatever you're explaining, you, you will refer to uh, the context where, you know, where Arjuna, it was, for Arjuna, it was just about his senses and he was being dragged down by them. Now, uh, whatever you, uh, lectures are there, okay, for, you know, spiritual enlightenment, okay, though we know that, you know, uh, that's what is right, okay, uh, we still go ahead and do, you know, something uh, which is not right, actually, which we know that, you know, it's what we are doing is not correct, which is not there, you know, as in the Bhagavad Gita or as taught by the Masters. So, why does it happen, sir, you know, uh, so it is happening because of illusion, because of pragyanvad, because of attachment. Speculative understanding as to what is the correct thing to do. And it's not difficult to apply these rules. As I said, that you do have certain responsibilities and duties, but then if you are getting carried away uh, and taking on responsibilities and duties which are not yours, you are deeply in illusion. So it is up to you. It is a free choice. So if somebody is saying, yes, I surrender to this knowledge, I surrender to the guidance, I surrender to the spiritual master, and accept and acknowledge, but actually I am not going to do it, that is not surrender. That means you have not understood. You are just giving lip service. We are trying to portray that, yes, I am a very good boy, I am a very good person, but actually I am not doing any of those things because I am still attached to those things which are actually dragging me down and giving me the pain and I am saying, why am I in pain? And when you are told you don't want to uh, shift from that position because you are fixed on that. You are too much attached. So not enough healing is there, not enough understanding is coming. And not enough action is coming. So there has to be moderated action, dhir. You have to be dhir, balanced, steady. So unsteadiness is destabilizing you from your path. So you have to be very steady on this path and have a clear-cut understanding. What is my position vis-a-vis -vis my relatives, my duties? I have relative duties in the sense that I have uh, an ascending scale of duties, some are more important than others, what is it that I am giving the importance to? Ultimately, the importance is to be given to the duty of your eternal soul, because everything else is not eternal. In order to be able to fulfill the duties of your eternal soul, you must be able to get rid of your karmic debts. And your karmic debts are not what you think they are, necessarily. Your karmic debts are different because you are assuming that this is my debt, I have to do it. It is a self-assumed responsibility or a liability, uh, which it may very well not be. And it is coming out of sentiment. Arjun was in the same position. How can I do this? How can I kill my relatives? How can I give up on them? Yes, you have to. There is no other way. They will not learn otherwise. <laughs> Who will learn? You have the same problem in your own life. That, you know... If I don't do this for my relatives, uh, some great uh, disaster will befall them. I am the savior. Huh? False ego. I will skill myself, sacrifice myself for my relatives. False ego. It's Arjun's position. Your position is the same. We discussed this a couple of days ago. Exactly the same place you are in. Yes. So you, you cannot go and fall on your sword for others. Here's the sword, kill me. No. You have to preserve yourself. You have to preserve your path. You have to preserve your spirituality. We are not saying do not support them. Yes, but you cannot support them at the cost of your own progress in spiritual life. 
if I'm going to be very stressed out and tense that, you know, I have to serve everybody, I have to do it for them, for them, for them, nothing for me, 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 then you are the one who's going to be so frustrated and upset and disillusioned and unbalanced and depressed and unhappy. All the things that Arjun was on the battlefield, willing to give up his entire career, what he had worked for up to that point in time. Because totally an illusion in attachment to the family. Yes, you have a duty towards family, but you don't have an endless duty. You have a relative amount of duty to your family. Yes, certainly. Please fulfill it. Fulfill your obligations. And your obligations are not what you think they are necessarily. It is not what others tell you, not what motivated people are telling you, that is your obligation, you must fulfill it. You must kill yourself, and but you know, you must send me all the money that you earn. No, not at all. I have to have breathing space, I have to have a backup, I have to have a safety net. So, a little wise, discriminatory aspect, yes, I will send. This is what I can say. I can do this. that we are able to do what you are telling us. You are able to do it if you decide you are able to do it. It is only your fear, it is only your anxiety uh, that will keep you in that illusory position. Nothing else. You have the knowledge in front of you. You have the guidance clear-cut in front of you. It is entirely up to you how much of it you want to follow or you don't want to follow, you'd rather continue that way, it's fine. That's your choice. But the reality is this, so do not think that you are very wise, do not think you are very elevated in spiritual consciousness or knowledge, or even uh, theoretical knowledge, because you are not applying. So being theoretically knowledgeable is useless, prajnanvad, nonsense using theoretical knowledge, speculative, speculation, speaking words of speculative knowledge, you know, using, cobbling together a whole bunch of quotations from somewhere and some things that support your view, and you present it almost like a lawyer, you know, this is the position that I am holding. But those things have no fundamental uh, application to where you are. So it's all useless where it doesn't apply to you, where, you know, these are just words, or these are statements taken out of context, taken out of the meaning, and the spirit is not there of those uh, teachings or those words, and you are using those, it's no good. It doesn't serve the end, doesn't serve the purpose. Hanji. So in life, uh, uh, like taking forward uh, his discussion on the is, is it something since we are not really informed uh, to what extent our duties are, our responsibilities, and most of the time you rightly said, we if we are in a better position, we try to act like a big daddy or everything I am controlling and all that stuff. Is it going to be a good thought or an idea? Uh, we should do it uh, things for our nears and dears to that extent which it doesn't affect us or it gives us a thought, I'm overdoing it or why am I doing it or uh, I think I should do more or something like that to that effect or is my understanding correct? Sir? You have to understand how are you making these decisions, what you have to do. First of all, how are you coming to the conclusion this such and such a thing is my duty for my near and dear ones? Give me an example. What is your thought process when you get into that? Uh, Okay, I'll take a very basic example is, uh, 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 like, uh, we have a son. So, uh, our duty, uh, what we see is, yes, he should get an education. To that extent is, I feel it's our duty. But uh, whether he should uh, do his education abroad, India, or in some premium institute, or we overstretch ourselves, that I feel, I think, is, is overburdened for uh, Yes, you don't overstretch yourself. Yeah, this is what my understanding is. Yes. You should not overstretch yourself. That is exactly it. And you should not hand over everything on a plate because the person does not appreciate it. True. If somebody doesn't work for something, if they haven't worked hard or have not uh, gone through the steps of earning something, they have no value for it. True. Or very little. 
So you only value something that is coming out of some pain that you had in achieving that thing, some effort you've made, some work you've done, and that is good. But if everything is served to you, there is no discrimination as to whether this is good or bad. It is almost like a very rich beggar that he has received everything and he has no discriminatory power. What is the difference between one thing and another? So he does not appreciate the difference. Like, uh, you know, the, the the beggars in the example of Dr. Mikau Sui's life, they did not appreciate the difference between Reiki or money or food or whatever they were getting. They were used to getting things free with no effort, no work. So no effort is not a problem. Work is a problem if you don't do the work. Effort means difficulty, but forget the effort part. It's the work that somebody has not worked for something and he gets something. Either he is ungrateful, he does not appreciate enough and therefore does not give it enough importance. The other person who has worked for it and given it to him on a platter, he knows how much he has worked for it. So it means more to that person. So that is always a mismatch. So the person has to be able to understand in practice and in fact that this is something that is to be earned. It's not your right for everything. Yes, you have the right to be educated by your parents, but you do not really have the right to choose where. It depends on the parent what they can feel comfortable uh, financing or putting you in a particular institution. Now, if you say, no, I will go abroad, well, okay, are you going to get a student loan and go abroad? Please, most welcome. You know, I'm not going to kill myself. I'm not going to kill my retirement fund just for you, because in my old age, you're not going to be around. You're not going to be here looking after me. So, the first order of business is you save yourself. And you carry your dependents with you. But remember, your dependents will turn around and uh, let you down at some point if you have this unlimited faith. And you do not protect your future and you do not protect yourself because everything is changeable. The Bhagavad Gita tells you that what is family, what is relationships, what are bodily connections, they are all changeable and temporary. There is nothing permanent. So it, why do you think that in families it will remain permanent? It won't. So you need to secure yourself first. You need to be able to give your children the education and the knowledge so that they become independent, not dependent on you anymore. When you say, I want to make him independent, and yet you are doing everything to make him dependent, how does that compute? It doesn't compute. There is no logic to that. So in itself, within this limited understanding only, it is incorrect. If I am just going to make my child only dependent on me, uh, I am asking for trouble. That means I have to finance him for the rest of his life. No. You tell sometimes parents come, you know, my child is very troublesome, this, that, he wants this, he wants that, and if you don't give him, he gets very upset. And I tell them, send them to boarding school. Oh no, how we can send them? Because boarding school will straighten him out right there and then. Why? Because nobody is going to listen to his nonsense. They are going to ask for results, and they are going to say, you better perform, otherwise you are out. So if you are Convince your child that, you know, he can suck your blood for the rest of his life, <laughs> so to speak. Then you are in serious trouble. You have to make them independent. Send them away from you. The system of Gurukul was that only. You send the child away at the age of five or ten. You send him to the school, boarding school, away from home, so that he toughens it out, you know, roughs it out, and he gets toughened. He understands what is the harsh reality of life and he has an appreciation for what he gets. And that lesson, if it is given at an early age, is very important and never forgotten. So if you can find some institution or a place of learning like that, which is safe and is able to give the knowledge and the guidance and allow the child to develop his own talents because 
in his peer group he is forced to uh, you know interact with people within his age group and their different talents and different capabilities he will come to understand very quickly in this atmosphere where he is he was thinking he's such a great guy he's not such a great guy i remember when i was in boarding school we had all the sons of maharajas in my class and in my school and they all that and we were a pampered lot because uh, in some of some of them we had uh, the first term there were i think 30 of us who went to a place called holding house we didn't go to a main house we went to a transition place where we had servants to uh, serve us the chairs would make our beds they would give us tea they would give us everything they would do things for us but that was but it was still like partial not entirely you still had to do certain things you probably had to make your bed i'm trying to think you did but they could help you if you wanted it uh, but there was a little bit of help so that was to slowly attune you to the fact that you got to do everything for yourself and then the next term you went to the main house and boy you did everything yourself you did the only thing you didn't do was laundry you had a laundry service and you gave your laundry to them and they did your laundry and uh, gave it back to you but everything else you make your bed uh, sweeping also was not your job unless you mess up then you clean it up clean up the mess but everything you make your bed you polish your shoes you are responsible for your bath you are responsible for how you look uh, your clothes your responsibility there no servants so you get independent okay i can do this also what's the big deal you will find many children they can't even make a cup of tea they don't know how i know women who don't know how to make a cup of tea who <laughs> want to speak of children <laughs> they'll burn the water while boiling it <laughs> i had one lady tell me that you know even even the tea i can't make i i burn the water when i boil it <laughs> so what i'm saying is that you need to have basic life skills and it is better you learn at an early age these life skills either you are very intelligent and you learn or you have to go through the experience of learning it even if you are very intelligent it is better to have the practical experience of it okay any other question yes uh, so you spoke about uh, being you know concerned about our own uh, higher soul self interest So, yeah, in terms of acting it before us, is it just when we wake up, just connect to uh, the healing the energies of Reiki and the Kegi force? Yes, connect to the energies of the Reiki uh, energy and the Kegi force. Connect to your soul self, and you know you should ask yourself, what is it that I can do to help myself to get rid of my karmic debts? How can I discharge my duties and obligations and debts? and it's not a bad thing you shouldn't feel burdened but you should feel happy that here i am just in the course of my day through the healing modalities of reiki and the kq force channeling healing to everything that i do that re- removes my karmic debts and let me act in a balanced way so you become steady dear very steady instead of being unbalanced and you know running helter skelter here and there just hysterical and freaked out no need to freak out you act certain times it, it will take practice sometimes you will freak out okay come back to a stable position whenever you can and fix it by doing the healing you are going to get upset you are going to get uh, disturbed no doubt it's not that you won't get but those occasions will be less and less as you go ahead with your healing practice as you go ahead with this understanding of who you really are that is the most important thing because if you understand that you are the soul self which is separate from the body that is the only understanding that will carry you through every situation i am not this body that is the teaching today 
that we have received from the Bhagavad Gita, that you are not the body. The expansion of that statement, of that understanding, will spread into your daily life, and you will do the right thing. You will connect with the right energies and so on. So it's not a matter that should I now connect with the energies. You are doing that in any case. How is it helping you? Because you are still not moved from your internal mental position. So the only way you'll move from your internal mental position is to consider this. I am not this body. I am spirit soul. Aham Brahmasmi. So that should be your connection. First connection should be that. I am spirit soul and I am not connected to this. I am different from this body. I am connected to this body right now, but I am different. I am not the same. As long as you have the bodily concept, you will be in pain. So all pain, again, as Krishna has explained here, is coming from the bodily concept of life. So if you step away from your investing in the bodily concept of life, don't invest in it, you will be that much pain-free. Maintain your body, because it is important vehicle for you to achieve your goals. But don't invest in it in the sense that, you know, if I don't have this uh, expansion of the bodily concept on my side or my relative, my this one, my that one, I will be in big trouble. No, you won't. Relatives will come and go, friends will come and go, everything will come and go, your body will come and go. It's been coming and going. Every day your body is changing. You are going through many different bodies in your life. So, you're not having the same body when you were very young. When a little child is there, baby is there, very cute. Uh, that cute thing becomes a big monster later on. You know, <laughs> ugly character. That, <laughs> what? What happened to cute? Hmm? No more cute. Whereas the soul is constant. So that's what you should pay attention to. Do not neglect your duties, because, see, you are here because of indebtedness. And your body is helping you to get rid of your debts, but do not get entangled in the expansions of the bodily concept of life. Do not get entangled in the sense objects, because that is what gives you pain and unhappiness. So Arjun had the same pain and unhappiness because he was entangled in the bodily concept of life. The expansions of the body, my relatives, oh, what will I do? With, I, I cannot live without them, I would rather die. Hey? What is this nonsense, Krishna is saying? You are in Maya. Huh? Mayuti, he says. Okay. Yes, last question. Uh, when we are living our lives, you know, keeping our self-interest, you know, everything, we have certain, you know, principles to follow. And uh, the main four principles according to the Sanatana Dharma, like uh, no alcoholism, no uh, meat eating, uh, married life, and no gambling. So if these are not followed, okay, for us as healers, so... You will... You will come to that point eventually, and even if you don't come to that point, it is not a deal breaker. Why? Because you are not following that path. You are not following the technical Brahminical path. You understand? Because if you follow that prematurely, artificially, it will do a lot of damage. When you do your healing and you have some sensibility, you can stop certain things which you know are not good for you. You know that they are harmful for you. You have the knowledge base. But if you still have the desire, that sets up a conflict within you. Let's say you have a desire for meat eating. And you are forcing yourself not to eat meat. You will always be thinking about that, what you don't have. So your focus is constant. If you have a desire for sexual activity and you're forcing yourself to be celibate, I have seen people who have gone on this path and they've actually lost their mind, they've lost their balance completely. Frustrated. 
because artificially done at too early an age, at too young an age. So these are relative. You are not following that specific path, so you, you do not need to overly concern yourself with that. But those principles are valid. It's when you can follow it. So life, as you do your healing, life will put you in a position and your body where you are going to follow it. For example, when you do your healing, we find two of the things that disappear from healers first is alcohol and meat eating instantly. I mean, very, very fast. There are healers sitting there, your own life, I don't know. How many of you have experienced that? That you can't just have it, you just feel unwell when you have it, right? So your body is is rejecting those things. And maybe even uh, uh, illicit sexual activity also comes down or disappears. But there is nothing wrong with sexual appetite. It is healthy, it is part, it's an appetite. So any appetite which is not satisfied is going to create frustration, but it has to be channeled in a particular way that is healthy for you and for anyone else. You do not want to go randomly uh, exercising your sexual appetite on people who are unwilling, for example. That is very improper and uh, severely punishable. But you need to understand, you need to understand that you are not ready, so do not think of yourself so highly qualified. If you are having those appetites, okay, I have those appetites. And I am indulging in them, I am sending healing to it, I can do nothing more than that, because I am helpless in one way. But as you age, your senses again will become weak in that direction. And some people, they don't. But you do the healing, and generally you will come to a balanced position. There are many things that you cannot follow strictly because those injunctions are meant for a particular section of society who are following very strictly and you are not actually. But you need to have a safe release for all these things, a safe place to release this. So for example, the institution of marriage is for that purpose only, so that you have a safe release of your sexual appetites. That's a safe place to satisfy them, which will not derail you from your higher purposes of life, of liberation and so on. Otherwise, what is the meaning of getting married? It is a commitment that you are going to progress, help each other to progress, you are going to bring uh, a new generation of people into the world, hopefully more qualified than you to understand the spiritual path and to achieve where you may or may not have been able to do it, let them take over from there and go further, and they will help you on their path. So it's a, it's a mutual help group. But where it becomes one-sided, then it is no more a mutual help group. There's no mutuality in terms of help. So there is disbalance. So family structures uh, fall apart because of that, because of unbalance. Expectations not met, overly burdening some family members. And then again the body, this is all the bodily concept of life which is coming into play. There is nothing forever. So things come together and the things fall apart. But you remain constant. So that constant factor is the most important factor. And the qualities and the needs of that constant factor need to be served over and above all of the needs. So the spiritual needs need to be served above all. And it is not that they are exclusive or you exclude the other needs. No. You have to balance them all. Some you may not want to get involved in anymore, fine, leave those. Those that can be left, you leave. Those who can't be left for right now, in time they will be leaving you because everything is changing. Right? You won't have those considerations anymore. You will move on, the people will move on, they will change direction. Not a problem. 
new things will come to replace those older ones. So we conclude here today, the 14th text, chapter 2, Bhagavad Gita. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Okay, thank you for coming. And we'll, next week is the Shara? Hmm? 22nd, today is 16th. Thursday. Thursday is the Shara. So Thursday evening we will not be having the Thursday healing assembly. So inform those who are not here today who are coming that next Thursday uh, they should follow whatever they follow in the Dusera celebrations of their own home and their own family. And it's important to celebrate this with people who are your family or close to you, rather than going here and there, and even in Diwali for example. Because those energies you need uh, staying with you rather than distributing them at third person's places. So it's good if you Focus on keeping the energies in your own home environment, wherever your home is, wherever you stay, it's better. Okay? Thank you. There is some prashadam downstairs. So how many people are fasting? There is some fasting prashadam and then there is lots of non-fasting prashadam also. <laughs> You've been listening to Bhagavad Gita for All a lecture series by Nalan K. Narula. Explore our website, gettingpositivekarmanow.com, for more on how to change your karma and destiny.